Morning. No, 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 no. All right. Good morning. Morning. Great morning. All right. Praise the Lord. This morning in our Sunday school hour, as our theme for the month is the gospel, the truth of the gospel. This is the primary truth in the entire world. This is the most important subject that you'll ever study in your life. This is the only topic that can save your soul and make you free permanently. It's the gospel. The gospel means the good news. If you're saved, it's because you heard the gospel and you chose to believe the gospel. The gospel is paramount when it comes to topics in the church. And for this month, we've been focusing on that and really dialing in. My heart's desire is that all the Lord's people were prophets, just as Moses said. My heart's desire is that everyone would be able to be able to preach the gospel and teach somebody how to be saved. I've been soul winning for years. Even I started going soul winning when I was 11 years old. That's when I saw my first salvation when I was 11 years old. I had a partner. It was my brother. And I'm very thankful for the opportunity to preach the gospel in the simplicity of the gospel and see somebody who heard of Christ but did not understand the gift of God and they called on the name of the Lord. They received salvation by believing in Jesus. I believe that every Christian has their own ministry because God has called us to tell others. He has called us to be witnesses. He said, ye shall be witnesses. He's telling us, he wants us to witness to others that we have been set free, we've been made free, we're no longer captives, and God has redeemed us. This is so important and it's so powerful. And so with this thought for this morning, I want to give you a basic soul winning presentation, a, a basic soul winning plan. If you would go ahead and grab your Bible. <coughs> go ahead and grab your Bible and I'll share with you my most favorite, favorite verse in the whole Bible. And that is Romans 6, 23. Romans 6, 23. A little while ago and time flies. I think it was actually two and a half years ago or so. I did a series of messages on particular verses that you could preach the entire gospel from. And John 3, 16, 1 John 5, 13, John 5, 24. There are a lot of great verses that people like to pick as their favorite and to use to tell others of who Jesus is and what he's done. My particular favorite has ultimately become Romans 6, 23. I believe all the elements that are necessary for understanding the gospel are found here. And so whenever I have just a moment with a person, this is my go-to verse. There were some young men this week that broke down in the parking lot and they ran out of gas. And uh, you know, they were just young teenage boys and he was pushing it. He knew better, and all, but he ran out of gas. And of course, I was playing with him, giving him a hard time. I said, I either thought there was a drug deal going on in the church or you, you ran, you know, something was wrong. And he starts laughing. I got him some gas, which was an opportunity for me to tell him the truth about Jesus. That if you'll look with me in Romans 6, 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. That means that we deserve hell for breaking God's law. Then it says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God wants to give you a free gift. It's called everlasting life and it never ceases. And we only get it through one person, one way. That is the Lord, that means he's God. Jesus, he was the son of man. Christ, he's the only savior, the only Messiah. Being able to tell him this verse off the top of my head and use it as a way to preach the gospel, I believe was a blessing to him. And there are many people like that that I've had that opportunity. I want you to memorize that verse and use it to preach the gospel. But better than that, this morning I do have some handouts. If I could get a couple young men to help me. Now, I have two versions of these handouts. I have a lot of the little ones because I want them to fit in your Bible. But if you're hard of seeing, like me, I carry a big Bible, you can get one of the big ones. There's a lot of the little ones and a few of the big ones. If you guys would help everybody get exactly what they need. Um, if you want, you can take two of the little ones. There's enough. Uh, one to go and one to show, one to paste in the back of your Bible and one to give to somebody because this handout is designed where if you meet somebody and you preach the gospel to them and they get saved, you could actually leave this with them and they can take it and study it for themselves. 
I wish I could tell you that this had every objection that you'll ever run into as you preach the gospel. Some people trust in baptismal regeneration, but we know that 1 Corinthians 1.17 tells us Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Well, that's not on here. There are many objections. Unfortunately, I couldn't fit in a single sheet or worse than that, a half sheet, if you don't mind squinting. The idea here is that you can begin to arm yourself. Thank you, sir. And with these verses, I have a pattern here where the blue ones that are underlined, this is a pattern sort of, a, of essentials. Now, here's the thing about preaching the gospel. Everybody has their own style. And what you're looking at here is a modified Romans road. Some people don't like the Romans road. I don't think there's anything wrong with the Romans road. It's the word of God and it's for salvation. So I love it. But I do understand that there are people out there that don't preach the gospel as thoroughly as they should. And they leave people with big gaps in their understanding about salvation. And I am opposed to that. Um, I've seen people that, you know, I can get somebody saved in five minutes. And I'm like, you know, that sounds very proud and boastful. Me personally, I would spend an hour with you compelling you and giving you as many verses as I can to help persuade you to trust in Christ and to stop trusting in your good works or your false religion. I've, I've spent more than an hour many a time with people. I've spent uh, up to an hour with a Muslim and with a Mormon and with different people because I love the lost as Christ did and we should love them enough to tell them the truth. Sometimes we just plant the seed and later God will send another soul winner to water that seed so we should do the best job that we can. Now with this handout, if you'll notice at the top, how to be born again, adopted into God's family, forgiven of all your sins instead of suffering an eternal hellfire. I just tried to summarize it right here. <coughs> Pardon me. Bible verses for salvation. Now, this is a plan of salvation, but as I was just instructing somebody last week, salvation is not just about a plan. It's not just about checking certain boxes. Salvation is found in the person of Jesus Christ. The example I used with the soul winner, I said, what if, what if we changed the thought? And I said, what if you were talking about your mother? We all love our mama, don't we? Amen. amen. You young men back there better say amen. You, you love your, your mama, right? Amen. amen. Yes, sir. Now, if somebody said, no, if somebody said, Hey, tell me about your mama. You said, well, first you have to believe that there is a mama. <laughs> and then you have to believe that mama has rules. And if you break mama's rules, you're in trouble. There's a punishment coming. Now think about it. When we preach the gospel, sometimes we're very stiff and rigid. And some people, it's because we're nervous talking with others. I've seen some people that are awkward in public. They're not a social butterfly. But when it comes to the door of preaching the gospel, they take their duty so strong that they just become a different person as they're filled with the Holy Spirit and they go out of their way to compel people to trust in Christ. If you were to tell me about your mama, you would tell me how much she loves you, the wonderful things she's done for you, and how great it is to have a mama that really cares. And I want you to use that same thought as we think about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a God that cares. I give you a plan of salvation, but it's not about a plan, it's about a person. I give you a method that's very similar to how, how I often do it. However, I never do it the same because every person is different. It's good to have structure so that you know you're not leaving anything out. That's very important. The three points, if you'll notice on this, are believe that you deserve eternal hell for sinning against God. Believe that salvation is only by trusting in Jesus, not good works. And believe that salvation is everlasting life, the forgiveness of all sins. I believe these three points are completely covered in Romans 6.23, like we just read. It starts with the punishment for sin. And this is important. If you're talking to somebody 
And they will not say, I'm a sinner. I've broken God's law. I deserve a punishment for breaking God's law. I deserve hell. You cannot continue with the rest of the verse. If somebody is not convinced that they're drowning, then you cannot convince them to receive the life vest. It's that simple. Hey, your house is on fire. I don't believe it. Go away. I'm telling you, there's a fire coming. It's going to destroy everything. You're going to die. You better get out. Come on, go away. The fire department, will, I'll take care of it myself. Oftentimes in soul winning, people don't see the urgency of it because they have a lack of understanding. It starts with this foundational concept. You must believe you deserve hell. Sin is when we break God's law. Let's take a glance at some of these verses. Romans 3.10. I love to start here because I love to end in Romans 10.10. And they both deal with righteousness. There are none righteous, no, not one. Nobody's perfect. I'm not a perfect person. Are you? Hey, now I know some people that think they're perfect, but we know the truth, they're not. <laughs> in the same chapter, you can go to verse 23. We've all sinned. We've all broken God's law. If you see the notes here, we have some extra verses that help. This is extra ammo that if you will commit to memory, it will make you a powerful soul winner. Now, I've given you the cheat sheet of evangelism. I gave you the small copy. You can stick that in the back of your Bible. You can paste it in there. If you want to get serious about helping others trust in Christ, what I recommend is take three by five cards and you write out every verse in your own handwriting and you write one down and you memorize it. And when you have the whole verse, you go to the next verse. And you do the same thing and you add to it and you add to it. And you just continue building on that. So eventually you have a deck of cards that you can flip through and learn and memorize. I strongly recommend you do it with handwriting. There are applications for cell phones that can do that. And you can click and guess and click and guess. But, but there's something about seeing and saying and writing and reading all at once. You're using all of the senses. There's just something more powerful about it. Now, if you're blind like me, uh, you know, get a full sheet of paper and a big Sharpie, okay? Uh, but the idea is you want to write it out for yourself. Jeremiah 17, we know the heart is deceitfully, is deceitful and wicked. Isaiah 64, our righteousness is filthy rags. John, 1 John 3, 4. Now, some people always go there when they preach the gospel. I rarely go there, but I know where it's at. And I always phrase it or paraphrase it or quote it as best I can that sin is a transgression of the law. If I run the stop sign at the end of the road, is that man's law or is that God's law? It's man's law. But if I lie to you, whose law am I breaking? God's law. Well, there must be a punishment for breaking God's law. Romans 6, 23, if you'll notice, that verse is in every category. The wages of sin is death. Wages are something you earn. You go to work, you get a paycheck. It's an hourly wage, a salary wage, a commissionable wage, whatever it is, it's a wage. If you came to me and said, Brother Fannin, I need 20 bucks. I'd say, great, clean my truck and I'll give you 20 bucks. If you do the work, I owe you the wage, I have to give it to you. Well, the same thing goes with punishment. God said, if you break my law, I have to send you to hell. The wages of sin is death. When he says death, he's not just talking about the death of your body. There's something about you that will last forever. And I can't see it. Do you know what it is? Your soul and, and your spirit for that matter. They're both eternal. Your eternal destination is determined before you leave the earth. And it's not based on how good of a person you are. It's based on your opinion of Jesus Christ. On, are you trusting him for salvation or are you trusting in yourself or some other way? Revelation 20, verse 14 and 15 is perfect where it talks about death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. If you die and go to hell, it's like a second death. But how long does hell last for? Revelation 14 says, The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Revelation 21.8 gives us a list of people that deserve hell. And that's often how I'll introduce it. Revelation 21.8. Now, now I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Well, that's the, that's the part I like to emphasize. If you notice, I put all liars because it's essential. He, it starts out by saying, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers. Now, have you killed anybody this year? 
Brother Jeff, you're kind of a rough dude. I know you live with my... No, nobody this year. Amen. All right. <laughs> but what a great opportunity to say, but now let me ask you, if you did, if you murdered somebody in cold blood and you died without Jesus, where would you go? Straight to hell. Of course, we would deserve hell for murder. You can continue. He says, uh, the, the murderers and whoremongers, that's people that sleep around that aren't married. He says, sorcerers, that's like witchcraft and magic and Harry Potter. Now, now, Brother Jeff, have you been casting any spells this year? <laughs> Not yet. Okay. I know some of you thinking just in video games. I've had several guys tell me that just in video games. I'm like, I wouldn't play with witchcraft, my friend. But anyway, God hates that, right? But then he goes into idolatry. That's when you have something else instead of Jesus as God. And it's interesting, he turns the corner, and all liars, uh-oh, have you ever told a lie? Have you? Have you? Is anybody in here that say, I haven't lied? All liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Even though you're not a murderer or into witchcraft, You've broken God's law by lying, and that's all I need to know about you. You don't have to know my sins. I don't have to know yours. We're all found guilty. We're in trouble. We deserve hell. If somebody won't agree with you in these points, you cannot continue. This is where you have to emphasize. This is where you have to focus. This is where you have to help them understand God's judgment, who he is. It's the Lord Jesus Christ that will judge the world, and he already has. He's given us his word. If you notice here, I do give you extra verses. Whosoever maketh a lie, it says in Revelation 21. It says something similar in 22. Mark 9 gives us where it talks about the fire that, will, that is not quenched. It will never cease. Hell is eternal. These are important details. Some people think, well, yeah, hell, but that's just the grave, and there's no real fire, and you don't really stay there, and it's not, you know, you just disappear real quick. That's not what the Bible teaches. My second point. Believe that salvation is only by trusting in Jesus, not by good works. So if you notice, some people will break this into four or even five points. Sin and hell. I put it as one. That's my one focus. If they don't believe they're a sinner, they don't believe they deserve hell, I don't go to point two. Number two, I use, you could also split this in two, but I put it as one. Believe that salvation is only by trusting in Jesus, not by good works. Some people present the life of Christ as a single point, and then trusting in Christ is essential for salvation. I blend the two because so many of the verses, in context, you can preach that same topic in context in several places in the Bible. In Romans 5, 8, this is important because this is where you make the turn. This is where, now I've told you the bad news, let me tell you the good news. But while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even though you still sin and you deserve hell for that sin, Jesus loves you and he already paid for all of your sin. Every one of them. He either paid for it all or you're trying to earn it yourself. This is so important. I ask people, do you believe, and, and I ask it in such a way, uh, do you believe that Jesus died for all of your sins? And as they're saying, they're answering, most say yes. I continue my statement, or do you think you can lose your salvation? Many Pentecostals have this mentality. I just say a prayer, and I'm good to go, and then Friday night I sin. Saturday I wake up, I feel guilty. Sunday morning I'm going to go down to the altar and pray another prayer, and I'm good to go again for another week. They don't really understand the gospel. They don't. We're trusting in Christ that paid for all. Believe that salvation is only by trusting in Jesus, not by good works. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 defines the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection. Most of the people that you talk to, if you're out soul winning, that want to listen and want to get saved, would call themselves Christians. But they would also tell you they're not 100% sure they're going to heaven. Many of them would... Well, and I get, are you 100%? Well, are you 50%, 70%, uh, 80%? Oh, 80%. Okay, does that mean you're 20% sure you're going to hell? <coughs> well, yeah. A lot of people have doubts. We're here to dissolve doubts, as the Bible says. And we dissolve doubts by putting our confidence in Christ instead of ourselves. 
We don't trust ourselves. We can't trust ourselves. We can't make provision for the flesh. Jesus, know, like he said, he knew men. And what was in them? We need the light, which is Jesus Christ. He's the true light that lighteth all men. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. We have to go out and preach the light. Many people will know who Jesus is, believe the Bible is God's word. They'll even understand things like the Godhead and eternity and the judgment seat and the return of Christ and still yet not be saved, not be settled in that Christ has finished the work or that they're fully relying on him. Many think they have to do good deeds and bring a sacrifice, bring an offering, change their life around to receive the gift. Doesn't work that way. Notice we're back to Romans 6, 23, that eternal life is through Jesus Christ our Lord. I use this as an opportunity to preach the Godhead. Jesus, it was the Son of Man. He was 100% flesh. He was tempted at all points like as we are, yet without sin. I have references to those verses here. A lot of times I personally hit it when I get here. I like to, I, I use Romans 6, 23 as my uh, Swiss army knife of the gospel, if you will. <laughs> He's the Lord. Many people are confused and they think that means I have to submit as a servant, be ready to submit for the rest of my life. By Lord, it means he's God. He's Jehovah. Jesus is Jehovah. He is the I am. He was before Abraham. He is our creator. I've given you a section of verses on that. But being Christ, he is the Messiah. He's the only savior of the world. Acts 16 is a very important area. I will take people to there and as I'm turning to it, now, I will define terminology with the Bible. Some people are confused. Some people think born again is one concept and being a saint is another. That's the same thing. Some people think salvation of the soul and being regenerated are different things. I like to reverse terminology to define it. Oftentimes, I'll tell people, uh, the Bible says, uh, they ask this question, what do I have to do to be saved? Or they'll, they'll say the question, what, how do I get born again and know I'm going to heaven? And as I'm going there, I go to uh, Acts 6, 16, verse 30, where it says, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Many people, I've asked, I'll ask people say, what do you think you have to do to go to heaven? They'll say, uh, get saved. And I'll say, okay, how do you do that? Uh, get born again. And okay, um, and I'm really trying to dig in and find out what they believe. And I say, well, how do you get born again? Well, uh, be good, keep the commandments, turn from sin, go to church, take care of your family. Oh, keep the commandments. Uh, can you name them? Oh, you can't name them. What if I told you it was a lot easier than that? And this is the good news. This is why the gospel is called the good news. Salvation is easy. Jesus did all the hard work. The Christian life is hard. Living up to God's standard and keeping his commandments as we should if we want his blessing, that's hard work. But we need to do it. He says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He does not say, keep the commandments to be saved. John 3, 16, of course, famous. Whosoever believeth, that's anybody that's trusting in Christ shall not perish. You won't go to hell. It's important to define that terminology, not just reading the verse, but tell them that whosoever perish in context, he's talking about those that are born again, John 3, 3, John 3, 7. You won't go to hell when you're born again. You get to see the kingdom of God. You go to heaven. Explaining those things as you go along is very important. John 1 is a super powerful passage. John 1 gives you a dozen or 14 different names for Christ, understanding his titles and his power and how he represents himself. He tells us he is the word, that he was with God, that he is God, that he is our living word, but he is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. There are three in heaven. There's the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. These three are one. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, of course, another classic there's a couple people in here that say, I got saved when I heard that verse and I understood that verse, that it's not by works. 
I, I, I believe Brother Jake was one, and you may have been one. There's a couple guys I've talked to with Pentecostal where they're kind of mixed up on their doctrine. And it's like, what, I, I just see it, and it's like, I'm being told, I'm not saved by good works, but I thought I was doing good works, and I believe in Jesus, but I keep struggling in my life. And I say this, not of works, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. A gift is free. If I said, hey, I'm going to give you my Bible, it's a free gift. And I say, but give me $2. Well, it's not a gift. You're paying for it. If I say, here, take my Bible. It's a free gift, but you have to be a good person. Well, you're working for it. You can't work for salvation. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Should we work? Of course, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you go into verse 10. He says, we should do good works. Once you're saved, the Holy Spirit moves in to help you live as a child of God as He wants you to, and He helps you get on the right path. That's God's will for your life, but His first will is that you would believe on the Son, John chapter 6, verse 39 and 40. Continuing Galatians 2.16, very powerful. Galatians 2.16, if you don't have it memorized, you should totally memorize it. We're not justified by works, but by faith. Galatians 3.26 is also a great one. We're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. I gave you two sections here about how Jesus is God and He is Creator. I gave you several great verses on that point uh, to help you to be able to answer questions if somebody doubts in that area. Oftentimes, I will ask people, do you believe Jesus is God? And they'll say, um, I think He's the Son of God, which, by the way, when the Jews were looking for the Son of God, they understood that that was very God. When Jesus said that God was his Father, they picked up stones to stone him because he made himself equal with God. Philippians 2, 9 tells us he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Or actually, yeah, it's verse 9. Continuing, verse point number 3, we're almost out of time for our Sunday school this morning. Believe that salvation is everlasting life, the forgiveness of all sins. Before I continue, I have to say, in eternity, all sins were paid for. And once you take the gift, your name is written in the book of life, and Revelation 3, 5 says it will not be blotted out. Your sins are paid for. They won't be once named unto you when you get in eternity. But here's the thing. In the flesh, in this world, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. A Christian with the power of the Holy Spirit inside of them should work to walk in newness of life. That's not how we're saved, and we don't have to do that to keep our salvation. Jesus gave us the free gift. We have to believe that salvation is everlasting life. Some people believe in a temporary life. Well, I had it until I did that real bad thing, and then I lost it. And you're like, so that bad thing was a sin that Jesus didn't pay for? Romans 6, 23, the gift of God is eternal life. And here's the question. How long does eternal life last for? Forever. I gave you the first answer of the answer, right? How long does everlasting last for? Forever, forever, forever. Does it last for 100 years and then stop? No. A million years? Does it last up until that point where you really sin again? I mean like a presumptuous sin. Is that when it stops? No. No. That's a sin that Jesus died for, but here's the warning, Christian. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, he scourgeth. If you're his son, he's going to correct you. He's going to give you a whooping. And even warns us, he says, hey, there is a sin unto death. I was talking to Brother Chad about this. I, I know of a couple different people throughout my life growing up in church. Young men that we knew in the church, they were running in the wrong direction. They were doing the wrong things with the wrong people. And then all of a sudden, they're falling out of church. And then we get the call. Oh, did you hear about so-and-so? Sunday morning, their car's in a ditch. They're dead. They were up Saturday night doing things they shouldn't do. Now, there is a sin unto death. Brother Chad was telling me about a very similar example. Somebody in his church, good Christian, no doubt of his salvation. Went in the wrong direction with the wrong person or the wrong thing. God killed the man. Spared his son in the car and killed the man. There's a sin unto death. If you're a Christian and you think, I'll go live like the world, you better look out. God might kill you. And with that being said, I want you to understand salvation is eternal. It's everlasting. God's not going to lie to you and change his mind. He's not going to trick you. He's paid for it all. 
But he gives you the power of the Holy Spirit to move in to help you to become more like him. And if you run from him, he might bring you home early. John 5, 24, that you have everlasting life. You've passed from death unto life. Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Titus 1, 2 is huge. If I told you, hey, I'm going to give you a gift. Here you go. It's totally free. But then I change my mind for any reason, and I break my word, and I take the gift back. Oftentimes people say, well, that'd be an Indian giver. Well, sort of, but if I break my word, if I say I'll do one thing and I do another, you would call me a liar. And Titus 1-2 says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Salvation has never been found in keeping a covenant, keeping a commandment, being circumcised, being baptized. It's always been found by faith in God's promise. We're saved by God's promise, and he doesn't lie. John 10, 28, neither shall any man pluck him out of my hand. When you're in God's hand, he won't let you go. Ephesians 4, 30, and Ephesians 1, 13 give us very similar verses that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. We're sealed unto the day of redemption. The illustration I often use is if I took a can of white paint, or here's, here's one Brother James really enjoyed. If I took a brand new jar of peanut butter that's never been opened, and I threw it in the mud, man, it's dirty on the outside, but you know what? It's sealed, it's clean on the inside. What a picture of our salvation. I'm sealed because of Jesus Christ. I'm clean by his blood. I'm purified by his sacrifice, not by how clean I keep the outside. But Jesus did say... Clean the inside, clean the outside, didn't he? His will for your life after you're saved is that you would keep his commandments. But we're not saved by the commandments, and we don't keep salvation by the commandments. John eleven twenty six. 26, Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And many people don't believe that. They think, well, surely if I, I could lose it. No. Hebrews 10, 10, he says, once and for all. Hebrews 13, he, he will never leave you nor forsake you. He's always there with you. Romans 16 tells us that the gospel is salvation to everyone that believeth. Doesn't matter your race, doesn't matter where country you're in, it's for everyone. Romans 10, 9. Now, I include this, and I, I want to be clear in this. Saying a prayer cannot save you. Period. I, I, all I have to do is, now what do I do? Repeat what? And I'm good to go? No, no, no. You have to trust on Christ in your heart to be saved. And how do I know that you've done that? Because I hear your confession. I hear you say, yeah, I believe it. I'll tell people, as we're going along through the gospel presentation, you see how this is different than what you believed before. Yes, this is different. Remember before you said you had to uh, turn your life around and live right and keep the commandments. Do you still believe that? No. What do you think you have to do to be saved? Believe in Jesus. What did he do for you? Pay for my sins. All of them? All of them. What if you murder somebody tomorrow? Are you still saved? Yeah. Is that a sin he paid for? Yeah. I mean, these are important questions. What about suicide? Now, that's always a hard one. There's two men in the Bible that committed suicide and still went to heaven. King Saul and Samson. They ruined the end of their life but they're saved. I don't encourage you to take that path. I'm going to warn you, don't take that path. There is a sin unto death. Don't go that way. Instead, why don't you live up to the full potential, the fullness of the stature of Christ? I go to Romans 10, 9. Some people have objections with this because they say, well, that was just for national Israel, for their salvation in the flesh. But he's talking about their spiritual salvation as well. It's clear how he starts out and how he finishes. They can't be saved without hearing the preaching. The only way they hear the preaching is we send a preacher. This is God's plan, not just for a nation, because he also says it's for the Jew and the Greek in Romans chapter 10. The confusion gets when you get to verse 13 where he says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Some people, not taking it in context, there is a group out there, they just say, Say the sinner's prayer and you're good to go. I disagree with that. If you haven't trusted in Christ in your heart, you're not saved. Rome, I start in Romans 3.10. There are none righteous, no, not one. Righteous means perfect. I end in Romans 10.10. 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. If you're trusting in Christ for salvation and not yourself, you're already saved. He's already paid for your sin. All you did was take the gift by faith. Now you're sealed forever. 
He won't break his promise. Your name is written in the book of life. And then I say, now let me help you tell God that you believe this and you want to be saved. Again, you're saved in your heart. Salvation is a matter of what you believe and what you trust about Christ, not how you live or whether or not you've said a prayer. I still pray with people because I want to encourage them to have a point where they say, this is the day I changed what I believed about Jesus. I used to think I had to be a good person, but now I understand he was the only one good and I'm saved by trusting in him. I hope that helps you. I understand there's a lot of other topics we could cover. I hope this is a blessing to you. You can stick it in your Bible and work on it. There's a lot of good verses. I had a list. I had to, I had to exclude many. I'm sure you could give me some good ones to add to it. But again, I just, my prayer is that this would empower you to have confidence in preaching the gospel to others and encourage them to trust in Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much and thank you for this opportunity to just talk about you, the wonderful things you've done for us, the death, the burial, the resurrection. Lord, thank you for paying for all of our sins at Calvary. Lord, I do pray that you would encourage all of us to get better at being a witness for you and telling others, Lord, we love you so much. Thank you for paying for us. We love you. We, Lord, I ask you to just bless this next hour coming up. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you're dismissed.